the, the final writing assignment. And uh, next week, for further to our substantive topic, I will speak a little bit about the final assignment and answer your question. But let me anticipate one issue. Uh, I don't want you to ask me whether a particular topic is good or bad. Uh, that undermines the purpose of the assignments. Uh, I want to be surprised. Otherwise, I would not have designed the assignment in this form. I'm surprised in both content and form. So <coughs> you don't have to choose a topic or format uh, under my guidance. I would much rather that you astonish me uh, than that you implement some recommendation of mine. But we'll, but we'll discuss it next time. Now today, uh, the three themes to take up. Uh, first, I want to return briefly to the discussion of democracy in the last class and the institutional content of a high energy democracy. Uh, then I want to turn to the theme of the organization of civil society outside the market and outside the state. And finally, to education. In next class, or at least in part of the next class, the subject will be globalization. And in the final classes, the final weeks of the course, I want to circle back to our general theoretical concerns, both normative and explanatory, the normative direction of this uh, proposal, and the theory of regimes, the ideas about social structural change and its social agency. The charm, but also the difficulty of an argument like this one, lies precisely in this relation between the institutional details and the philosophical generalities. And I want, to the end, to maintain a grip on both sides of this relationship. Now, democracy. So as I observed last week, the theme of democracy has a natural priority. It's not just one domain of institutional change along others. It is the domain that, in some sense, shapes the terms on which change in all the other domains can occur. Uh, so in extension, in time, it's natural that the subjects of political economy should have primacy because they are the practical heart of a progressive project and a progressive alternative. But in the order of importance of significance, we shouldn't imagine that the theme of democracy is just marginal. Uh, now, you will remember from last class that I began the argument sketching a contrast with respect to both the normative conception of democratic politics and its institutional expressions. Uh, Benjamin Constant's contrast of the, the liberty of the ancients opposed to the liberty of the moderns. And then the institutional history, which contrasts the very limited repertoire of constitutional alternatives, alternatives to the organization of democratic politics that is on the offer in the world, and what I call the outer circle, which is the idea of the leftist that representative democracy should be altogether replaced by direct or participatory democracy. And with respect to both of these oppositions, I took the same basic position. I said, 
Let's begin from the reality. Let's begin from what history has given us. So with respect to Benjamin Constant's contrast, the liberty of the moderns rather than the imagined liberty of the ancients, the real flesh and bones individual pursuing his private interests for whom the concerns of politics are, lar are largely an exception to the tenor of everyday life. And with respect to the individual, to the institutional history, I said, let's begin from the reality of the narrow repertoire of institutions of representative democracy, rather from this fanciful and largely failed alternative of direct or participatory democracy. But in both cases, the idea was that this would be the point of departure, but not the point of arrival. Now, what stands behind both of these instances is the same basic idea. Uh, and the idea can be formulated or reformulated in a language that I used before in the course. The contrast between two sets of moves. The ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. That's the normal form of politics and of democratic politics. And the extraordinary moves by which, from time to time, typically under the provocation of crisis, we challenge or change pieces of this framework. That's the point of departure of both in the normative conception and in the institutional level. So the idea is, rather than stipulating at the outset of the argument that we'll replace the narrow by the broad or the moderate by the extreme, we start from the historical reality, from the historical situation, and we imagine an extension. And the character of this extension with respect to both these aspects of the problem is, is to imagine how the distance between those two sets of moves, the normal, the ordinary moves within the accepted framework, and the exceptional moves by which we challenge and change pieces of this framework is gradually diminished. So that our power to challenge and change the framework piece by piece emerges more naturally or organically out of the ordinary mood. Then we would be freer, we would be, we would be more powerful. That would be an expression of the idea that we can be in the world without surrendering to. So that's the general direction. But it may be surprising because the intention of the institutional program is to be radical in its ultimate developments. But the point of departure is the point of departure of the immediate historical reality. So I sketch then five sets of institutional innovation that would describe the movement from the flawed democracies of today to the high energy democracy that I imagine. The first set of innovations had to do with the raising of the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life. The second set of innovations was the face of politics, and in particular with our ability to resolve or supersede impasse, and by that means to accelerate the pace of democratic politics. The third set of innovations had to do with the relation between strong initiative by the central power and radical devolution represented not as opposites, but as complements. The fourth set of innovations 
with the power of democratic politics to change structurally piece by piece a form of structural change that is localized rather than general, uh, and whose vocation at the beginning is to come to the rescue of social groups that find themselves imprisoned in a circumstance of subjugation or exclusion from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective political and economic action that are available for them. And the fifth set of institutions then, of institutionalization has to do with the relation between representative and direct democracy. And the thesis there is that rather than imagining the replacement of representative institutions by the practices of direct democracy, we imagine a series of initiatives by which representative democracy, little by little, takes on, in addition, some of the features of direct or participatory democracy. Now, I argued last week that no society could be expected to embark on such a direction of institutional change in order only later to decide what to do with the reform institution. So that the change in the character of the state and in the nature of democratic politics has to be triggered and sustained by some struggle over the social and economic direction. And in that sense, the progressive political economy, which it, with its themes, which have occupied much of our discussion during the semester, is the inevitable starting point. And then democracy, that the character of democratic politics is changed when it needs to change to make possible that redirection. The actual content of many of the proposals in, the, in this enumeration of the five sets of institutional innovation includes many things that are entirely familiar in contemporary experience and contemporary discourse. But when we put them all together under this conception that I uh, began to outline last week, it may seem to be a formidable task. Uh, and it arouses the specter then of some systemic change. But my intention is to say these changes are structural, but they are not systemic. They're not the substitution of one indivisible system by another. We change the structure piece by piece, and at the end, if we proceed in this direction, the change is indeed momentous, and we might even call it revolutionary, but its characteristic method is gradual and peaceful. Now, before I go on to the next theme, which is the theme of civil society and its organization, outside the state and outside the market, I wanted once again to ask you whether there's some part of these ideas about democracy that you want to discuss further. Uh, you were relatively silent in the last class when I provoked you, so I want to give you another opportunity. Yes. So for one of those changes, um, so I was looking at my notes to try and for one of the changes for participatory um, democracy and representative Can democracy. You speak louder. So for the changes of between representative democracy to participatory democracy, yeah. are those things like ranked choice voting and participatory budgeting, or did you have grander ideas? You no, know, there are things like that, but you say grander, I think the idea there is that in these large, complicated societies, 
the basic character of democratic politics continue to depend on representative institutions. But those representative institutions are then supplemented by episodes of direct democracy, like comprehensive programmatic plebiscites or participatory budgeting. Now, among the contemporary democracies, there is a significant range of variation. For example, a contemporary democracy in which direct political activity plays a much more prominent role is Switzerland. Now, Switzerland is a relatively small state, but it's not a tiny state, it's not a city state. It does have, it does give a much larger role to direct democracy. So, the idea is that this range of variation that already exists in contemporary democracy is then a provocation or an expression of a larger range of possibilities which we would build little by little. Now, I don't see the strengthening of the element of direct democracy as some kind of panacea, because direct democracy is subject to a characteristic perversion. The perversion is that under many of the forms of direct democracy, a small minority of activists and talkers of rhetoricians takes over in the name of this ideal of direct democracy. And they then bore and repel everyone else to death. That's the reality of these experiences of direct democracy. And that's one of the, one of the many reasons why this leftist fantasy of direct democracy failed. So that is, as it were, the vulnerability of the ideal of direct democracy. But the advantage or the attraction of it, if it can be formulated in a more realistic way, is that it has to do with this attempt to diminish the distance between our ordinary concerns in day-to-day -day life and this experience of politics. So what would most significantly contribute to the diminishment of that distance would not be any set of specific institutional arrangements in the sphere of politics narrowly construed. It would be the change in the character of economic life and of social life outside the market. So an inclusive and deep knowledge economy, as yes, I explored it earlier in the argument, requires an elevation of the level of reciprocal trust and discretionary initiative of all the participants in the process of production. Of production. It's no longer, as I said, a market order based simply on the generalization of low trust among strangers. It's, it's not reliant simply on a hierarchical command and control structure. It requires a flattening of hierarchies and a raising of the level of participation. And so that, in a sense, is a much more significant contribution to the advance of the ideal of direct democracy than any narrow institutional initiative like participatory budgeting. Because that's what changes the experience of everyday life then the day-to-day -day life of the individual as a worker, as a producer, as a participant in social life is then responsive to this ideal. I think that's much more eloquent, much more resonant than anything that we could do narrowly in the organization of politics. And that's where I would put my hope. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if you think that there are any examples today or throughout history where you've seen either a country or a municipality practicing high energy democracy? Well, now you're not talking about this particular issue, the fifth innovation, but about the whole package. Right? Yeah, and or if you think this would be a net new construction that hasn't yet been expressed. No, I don't think that there's any 
with respect to this and with respect to all of the themes that we discussed in the courts, I don't see any society that is, as it were, the wave of the future, that represents the future for us. Uh, there's a wide range of micro-institutional experimentalism in the world, which provides, as it were, the raw material for these things. But it's not, it doesn't congregate, it doesn't condensate in any particular state. That's, that's what I think. Uh, and I don't know what, whether someone has an opinion about this, whether there is a contemporary society that comes closer in its organization to this ideal of a high energy democracy that I outlined. Do you think there is? I don't know. It's, do you think there is? You who asked the question. I, I would be curious to look more at Estonia just from the basis of their participatory nature is digital. They're one of the few nations that has digital citizenship, digital voting. It's like an afterthought that they have to vote online. So to me, what you're outlining, I don't see how it's possible in the absence of technology, but it feels like we've reached a stalemate in many countries who've tried sure. to sort so of. So these small, very advanced societies like Estonia, Denmark, Switzerland, uh, may come closer to this in many of these technical aspects. Whether they come closer in the, spirit, in the spiritual climate which this idea of high energy democracy evokes is more doubtful. Uh, and that itself raises a puzzle, doesn't it? Because it shows that these transformations cannot be adequately understood it's just a transformation in the way of organizing things. They signal, they point to a, to a spiritual change also, uh, and, which is much less likely to be, to be present or to occur in these small countries that you mentioned. Hmm. Yes? Uh, it's a question, not a response to that. But I just wonder why you take democracy as the starting point for this, for increased energy and participation of society, rather than examining an alternative, for example, some form of anarchy or you know, and an alternative um, system of governance. Anarchy, well, for, well, first of all, because uh, I believe in the necessity of the state, so I'm not an anarchist. And I think the, uh, the state is the lever by which we can then transform the, the character of social life. The state makes the law, and the law is then, so there's this paradox about law, right? So theoretically, the law is supposed to be the expression of our choice of the terms of social life. But in reality, the law is a series of episodic interventions in a structure that is largely received, unspoken, unseen, unchallenged. That's now, but to the extent that we have a power to change, the power to change is largely exercised through the state. So it is by the means of this. So otherwise, what we would have would be customs, conventions, as in stateless societies that preceded the historical civilizations. And uh, then this, 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 this project of addressing the structure as a whole would seem to be beyond our reach. <coughs> So uh, that then leads to this idea that we need the state. And to this notion of democracy, of a high energy democracy, which is no longer just the government of, by the majority, qualified by the rights of minorities. It's, it's an idea of democracy as the perpetual production of the new. Uh, 
by which we liberate ourselves from this unchosen fate, fate collectively. So it's a kind of anti-fate politically, which is also what theory should be. Uh, so I think that's the appeal of this association of state and democracy as the elements that are indispensable. But I'm, there, I'm therefore taking the passage from a stateless society to a society with a state as irreversible. And of course, that's a controversial theme because, as your question presupposes, there are advocates who believe that we can circumvent the power of the state. Yes. Yes, I'm curious to ask uh, when you say spiritual, uh, would it be, uh, would, do you say it in the religious realm or in the non religious realm? And I would be very, uh, again, interested in asking how it can be modulated in a non religious realm, the spirituality, how can it pan out? Well, this is a, a formidable question, which I struggle to answer in the context of this argument. So, mm. uh, a, a very widespread characteristic of uh, religion today in the whole world is that uh, is the situation of half belief a halfway house between faith and the lack of faith. So, in which religion is diluted into an allegory or a set of metaphors, and uh, it is replaced by spiritualism of some kind, uh, rather than by any doctrinal faith. In the society, in the half Christian societies of today, that's a circumstance. And this situation of half belief is dangerous in two respects. First of all, because it represents a form of self deception which the, the individual, the believer, wants to believe, but is unable to believe, right? So William James said, people believe everything they can. So they want to believe, and they want to believe because the history of religion and of much of philosophy has been, in large part, the history of a set of lullabies by which we attempt to sing ourselves to sleep and console ourselves for the troubles of existence and the enigmas of the world. And we would want religion to be a form of liberation uh, and not of consolation. So that's the first problem with this. The second problem is that uh, if you examine the content of what is then proposed, by these, this semi-religious spiritualism that succeeds to religion, it is characteristically an ornamentation of the political and moral pieties of the day, the illusions of the epic, as Karl Marx called them. Uh, and we would think that religion, real religion in art, would be like a storm picking us up and carrying us in the direction in which we don't want to go and didn't imagine possible. And not just like a way of ornamenting the beliefs that we have anyway. So if this diluted spiritual religion is simply a restatement of the political correctness of these humanistic pieties, we don't need it. We need the storm. We don't need this. We don't need this adornment of what we believe anyway. So, uh, I think then the question is, uh, 
transformation revolution in the sphere of religion that we have to accompany these institutional changes. But that's another discussion, and it's beyond our, our, our topics are expansive enough. <laughs> Not enough to add this other thing, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask about one characteristic of the knowledge economy, which you called the combination of the machine and the anti-machine. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, how can we ensure, perhaps through political or spiritual intervention, that we're enhanced by technology rather than impaired by it? I see a lot of benefits to this idea of combining the machine and anti-machine, but I also see some risks in that when we stop flexing, or when we outsource certain functions to machines, might we begin to stop flexing those muscles, either physical or mental? And hasn't certain technology also made us less social and trusting, uh, which is one of your requirements to expanding the knowledge economy for everyone? So I was just wondering if you could speak to those risks. Well, first of all, let's step back and, and reflect on the concept of technology. So, here are two ways to think about technology. So one way is the way to which you just referred, in which the technology marks the frontier between what we've learned how to repeat and what we have not yet learned how to repeat. Uh, and so everything that we've learned how to repeat, we should be able to express technologically through the intermediate level of formulas and algorithms and so forth. Now, there's a complication there, as I pointed out in the earlier class, which is that it appears that now there are machines that are able to go directly from complex data to some analytic consequence of the use of complex data without passing through an intermediate level of rules so, for example, the use of artificial intelligence in the translation from one natural language to another without the specification of general rules of grammar or syntax. That's an example. So, but in principle, that's the basic idea. Huh? Now, a second way to think about technology is that technology is the materialization of the channel between our experiments in mobilizing the forces of nature and our experiments in organizing cooperation among ourselves. And, that, and so every machine is both dependent on the mobilization of nature, it's an intervention in the natural world, and a way of organizing how we interact together, how we work. So these two ways of thinking about technology should be combined in a complex way. Now we come to your question. Um, uh, the machine and the anti-machine. The anti-machine and that formulation is the human being. So the idea there is that in principle, what we have that the machines do not have is imagination. Huh? And what is imagination then uh, under this rule? So uh, imagination presupposes on one side this attribute that we call recursive infinity in, in, in mathematics. We can combine everything with everything else. Uh, but imagination above all means that we can distance ourselves from the phenomenon. That's the first move of the imagination. And then we can subsume the phenomenon under a range of possible variations in the domain of the adjacent possible. That is, what can happen next? That's how we understand things. So in order to understand anything in the world, we have to remove ourselves from it we have to deny it some of its brute facticity, its just thereness. And we have to imagine it as the expression of a range of possible transformations in this domain of the adjacent possible. 
So what we would have that the machines don't have is this power of imagination. The poet called it negative capability. We deny the actual uh, in order to deepen our insight into the real, we extend our imagination of the possible. Otherwise, we don't see something, we don't understand it, we just stare at it. Uh, or we have a kind of retrospective rationalization of it. So then, the, then, the, then there's the practical question, which is, how do we, in practice, then, affirm this power of imagination and distinguish ourselves from the machine so we can interact with the machine? Now, it will always be the case that, to some extent, machines will replace labor. They're supposed to replace labor. Even the most elementary tools, agricultural tools, uh, replace labor. They always have. But the machine can also enhance labor. Uh, and then we come to the question of the state that we were just discussing. Now, how then do we, how then do we arrange for the machine to enhance labor and not just to replace it? So the premise is technology has no imminent logic of evolution. The, it's, it's logic of evolution is the logic that we give it, we bestow on it. And the instrument for doing that is the state and, uh, and the law. Uh, so we can shape the evolution of technology through politics so that it not simply replace labor, though to some extent it, all, it always will replace labor, but it will also enhance labor. Now, even in very modest or prosaic activities, so for example, the character of the work done by the shelf stackers in supermarket chains or drugstore chains can be transformed by the use of technology. Uh, so some of the most onerous, burdensome, repetitious, deadening characteristics of the work can be lightened by the technology. And then we'll say, the state will participate, will influence the evolution of technology. It will impose fiscal incentives and disincentives. It will itself promote technological, the use of technological evolution in a certain direction. Uh, in, the, in the work of disseminating the knowledge economy, it will seek to develop forms of artificial intelligence that are susceptible to being used or assimilated by the backward, small, and medium-sized firms and by the individual economic agents who we want to transform into technologically equipped artisans and so forth. <coughs> so on the basis of this possibility of this potential, we then engage the powers of the state. That's the basic idea. Yes. Just on, on that note specifically, so I, I can see the argument that some technology will complement labor at the sort of higher wage end of the spectrum in terms of augmented reality, helping doctors, et cetera, et cetera. But I just gave an example of how it complements labor at the lower level. But so the shelf stacking example, yeah. if you're running a resale company and you've got this technology that means that you can work alongside one worker and they can stack shelves quick, quick, more quickly, you're just going to cash that by having one or two fewer workers, right? Like I, I, that, that efficiency saving will come eventually by having a smaller workforce, no? So it's true that there will be then a diminishment. So there, that's an example in which there's part replacement of labor and part transformation in the character of labor. Presumably other jobs of a different kind will be generated elsewhere in the system do that replacement. But not, not stacking shelves? Not, not exactly in the stacking shelves or in the same way. So, for example, one of the characteristics of these 
of this economy is destandardization or customization. And so customization is a more complex process. And uh, it's very hard to do, it's very hard to organize inventory on the basis of destandardization when there's a large variety of products. So the machines can help in that. And it's not, so it's true that labor will be partly replaced, but also a, a set of jobs will be created that, or a configuration of jobs that may not have existed in the earlier system. So I think the details are all troubling and difficult and, and, invo and involve some transformation of work. But the overall tendency, if one looks at it hopefully, is for there to be a diminishment of the contrast between the brutal, repetitious, and the inventive or creative. Not that that difference will disappear, but that will diminish. So this relates to a fundamental uh, set of alternatives in the idea of work, right? So you could say that in the history of the modern West, there have been three main ideas of work. So one idea of work has been work as an honorable calling. So you have a trade, a profession, and the trade and profession is the basis of your sustenance, but it's also the basis of self-respect and recognition in society. Uh, so you have this traditional trade and you're seen as, as doing this work and you take pride in it and so forth. That's work as an honorable calling. Then there's a purely instrumental idea of work. Work is simply to earn a living. And the sublime is in the pianissimo of personal life uh, and not to be found in work. And this uh, marries with Marx's and Cain's idea that work is a hateful burden to escape. And fortunately, we are able to, we will be able to escape it according to them because we're on the eve of the overcoming of scarcity. And I argued before in another context that we're not on the eve of the overcoming of scarcity, uh, but we can hope to transform the character of work. In a knowledge economy, work is creative and not just a hateful burden, but it's creative just for that small elite, which has dominated the heights, the commanding heights of the knowledge economy. Now, the third idea of work in the history of the modern West is work as a transformative vocation. So this is the thinker, the writer, uh, uh, the activist, so, uh, who transforms the world in some way or seeks to transform it, and by transforming the world transforms himself. So it's the prerogative of an elite. So behind these ideas about technology stands the hope that there could be a popular version of the transformative vocation, that some aspect of this higher idea of work, not just instrumental, not the honorable calling as in a traditional society, but this idea of transformation allowing for self-transformation would, would become a wider possession of humanity. Uh, and so the discussion we were having on, about technology and the imminent logic of technology bears on that. Now, I recognize a huge distance between so these are dreams, uh, uh, and like they say, in dreams begin responsibility. So we, we would this is this is where we this is where we we would start in this direction. Huh? But that at least signals the direction in which we in which we would want to go. Yes, I was wondering your thoughts about universal basic income and if 
if you would maybe classify it in terms of one of those three modes that you described. Well, someone asked me about this, or a version of this question, earlier, much earlier in the course. And what I said was this, that, that an idea like, so universal basic income is a version of an idea of social inheritance, mm -hmm. right? So the general idea is that instead of a small minority of people inheriting from their parents, from their family, everyone inherits a basic package of resources from the state. Now that can take the form of a, a rent or an income, or it can take the form of uh, an endowment of assets, like the baby bonds idea. Huh? There are variations of the same fundamental idea. So the general question, the general form of the question that you're asking, if I interpret it, is what should be our attitude to this idea of social inheritance? Now, I think that the attitude is that, that it depends on whether the social inheritance is the frontier, the limit, or whether the social inheritance is the counterpart to something else that's happened. So what I said is, these ideas are ideas that have to do with what I call the haven, which had with the historical concern of social democracy. We want the individual to be secure in a haven of safeguards against public and private oppression, and of capability ensuring endowment. Among these endowments are the social inheritance, like the minimum guaranteed income. Now, the question is this, is that the end in itself, or is that, as it were, the counterpart or the condition for something else to happen? And the general character of the argument that I've been advocating is that it's the latter and not the former. As we want the haven so there can be the storm. Uh, so we want to liquid, we, we want to open society to conflict and experiment, and we want the individual to be able to thrive, to flourish, to stand up, to enhance agency in the midst of this struggle. Uh, and I think this is a, a very fundamental idea. So the 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 going back to a, th a thought experiment, which I also invoked much earlier in the course. Imagine a spectrum of society. And one pole of the spectrum is a scriptural caste society. So the identity of every individual is inseparable from the regenification of social life. So his whole sense of security, respect, and identity is dependent on the preservation of the way of life associated with his caste. Huh? At the opposite pole of that spectrum would be a society in which we have succeeded in disentangling the haven from the storm. That is, we have secured the individual in the haven, but, it, but designed the haven in such a way that it imposes the minimum of rejudification on the surrounding social and economic space. Uh, and that's where we would want to go. Now, where do we stand today in these supposedly liberal societies with their systems of law? We don't stand at that second pole. We stand at some intermediate space because the forms of organization that now exist, the traditional law of contract and property, uh, do imply a partial rejudification of the surrounding space. And there is now a subtlety in the ideological discussion, which I think is not widely recognized. In the 19th century and up to the beginning of the 20th century, the idea was that this system of private law was part of the conception or the definition of freedom. That's what the classical liberals of the 19th century meant by freedom. To be free is to live in this order. And this was the Hayekian idea of market fundamentalism, as I said. 
if you trade long enough, you'll eventually reproduce the system of German private law, and that's freedom. Now, what do we believe now? We believe something that's more complicated, which is not that this is part of the conception of freedom, but that there's no way of replacing it without threatening freedom. So it's like a negative, diminished version of the 19th century thesis. We say, we, we recognize that this system has certain rejuvenifying implications, but its substitution by something else, like a like a, the state control of the economy, would threaten freedom. That's a different belief from the belief that existed before. And, and then it, it signals our inability to advance further on the spectrum. So that's what I would say about universal basic income. I want to know about the rest. So the institutionally conservative social democrats have the discourse about this about the haven. But where's the part about the storm? That's the part that's missing. And the discourse about the haven means something different depending on whether or, or not it's combined with the other discourse. So in a society like Finland, they experiment with minimum basic income, and their whole focus is on that, the exclusion of the of, of the basic conditions of life from economic insecurity. But it stops there. Where's the rest? Uh, so that, that's, that's the argument that we would begin to have. Any other remarks, questions? Are you satisfied with that answer to your question? Or do you want to it does. I was, I was just wondering also how it connected with your ideas about different kinds of work, you know, what, what sort of, uh, would, would more people be sort of pushed into that third category? Um, or, or would that third category be available to more citizens if there was, was that level of social protection? Well, so it's connected with this idea of the democratization of the, of the ideal of the transformative vocation. So, uh, you know what I have to believe as a democratic and experimentalist. So I have to believe, so I have to say, the Protestants and the Protestant Reformation believed in the priesthood of all believers, right? No priestly intermediary between the believer and God. As Democrats and experimentalists, we have to believe in the diffusion of prophetic powers in the whole of humanity. So everyone is a prophet and not just a priest, as the, as the Protestants. Uh, and then, and that's why then I use this this uh, analogy of the relation of the parent to the child. I said the parent says to the child, "I love you unconditionally. You have an unconditional place in my love. Now go out and raise a storm in the world." So that's what the parent has to say, not just "I love you unconditionally," but now there's the next step. The next step is to go out and, 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 and struggle, struggle with the world. Uh, and that's how you, we think, who's the we? Uh, I take that back. Uh, so I, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so there's this idea that we become more, God, we, we become more, more human by becoming more godlike by increasing our share in the godlike attribute of transcendence. Huh? And these discussions about work, about imagination, about technology, were all related to that. Uh, so, uh, and we can't live in a society in which the structures are petrified and be like that. So we have to be secure, but we have to be secure like the Seraph Abiel in, 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 in Paradise Life, unsubdued, unshaken, unterrified, uh, so that we can then engage. But, but that's not the end in itself. That's then the basis of the exercise of our prophetic vocation. And there's, that's the idea of humanity. That's how we become human. <laughs>
So it's not that we live in order to become godlike. It's that we become godlike in order to become ourselves. Uh, that's the notion. Question? Yes. Well, I don't know. I'm, maybe this is digressive, or we shouldn't go this far. I am not sold on the idea that this self-transformation and this godlike aspect of it is an imperative for a good human life in the way that I think you're construing it, where it's preference independent. Well, I have also, I mean, have this impression that academics in general tend to, I think, overemphasize the importance of creativity, because this is the bread and butter of our work, and I think we tend to overemphasize how good the gig that we have really is. Um, well, well, let me, so let, let, let's have a, a broad conception of creativity. But let me step back for a moment. So Kierkegaard, a philosopher, said, the war against repetition is the war against life. So we recognize that there's this element of repetition, which is inseparable from human experience. So the idea is not to dispose of the element of repetition, but it's this dialectic between repetition and novelty. Which is, which is part of, of our freedom. So going back to that idea of the contradictory conditions of self-instruction, I said one of them is that we be able to participate in a world without surrendering to it. Because we're not free if we're not participating, and we're not free if the condition of participating is surrendering. So somehow we have to participate and resist at the same time. Now, I don't see that as something which is uh, the prerogative of, of thinkers. Uh, so I think that's a universal uh, aim or ideal for humanity. Now, but there's a complication in this line of conversation, which is very fertile, but, but deserves qualification. So this is a particular conception of humanity that I'm developing in the answers to your questions. I don't think that an institutional program like the program that I developed is necessar necessarily depends on that conception of humanity. So it can be justified from a number of other perspectives. And this is like the idea in late liberal political theory of the Rawlsian idea of an overlapping consensus, that this, the same arrangements in a democratic society can be understood on the basis of different philosophical assumptions. So the, the caution is that there's not a one-to-one -one relation between the institutional proposals or arguments that I've made and this particular conception of humanity. This is a conception which has political implications, but it doesn't seem to me to be the indispensable basis for most of those institutional arguments. At some point, the philosophical conceptions will diverge in their political implications far ahead, but there's a broad range over which the same institutional claims can be justified on the basis of alternative philosophical assumptions. Yes? Sorry, I know you mentioned that this question might be out of scope for this class. Um, but my, my, my friend up here in the front row asked a little bit about the nature of spirituality and religion. And since we're talking about this notion of becoming more godlike, I wonder if you would be willing to say just a few sentences on how you think religion would need to transform in the context of I'm sorry, I'm not hearing part of what you say. You, you mentioned that in the sphere of religion, yeah. there would need to be changes in religious institutions, but that those discussions are technically beyond the scope of this class. But it, it, I'm wondering if you're willing to say just a few words on how those would need to shift. I may be willing to, but I'm not sure that I'm able to. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, 
we had these <laughs> we had these religious revolutions of two thousand years ago, like the so-called axial age, and we expand this thesis. It goes from the rise of prophetic Judaism to the prophetic activity of Muhammad. But in the middle is Buddhism, there's Confucianism, and, so forth. and these religious revolutions have many common elements. So they all imply a desanctification of the world. Uh, nature is not sacred. The sacred is something that lies beyond nature. Uh, they all affirmed that the sacred, separate from the world, must nevertheless become again. It, it must visit the world in some form. It must be imminent. So it's a dialectic of transcendence and limit. They all affirm that the divisions within humanity are shallow or epiphenomenal uh, of, of race, of class, of caste, of gender, and so forth. Uh, they all attack the then predominant ethic in the agrarian bureaucratic empires that were the main protagonists in the and affirmed an ethic of universal empathy and fellow people. And they were all ambivalent in a particular way, in which they could be seen either as a redescription of the world under in a different nomenclature, a different terminology, or as an invitation to transform the world. So if they say the slave and the master are fundamentally the same, do they mean that the institution of slavery should be abolished? Or are they simply describing the, something that the master and the slave, some fundamental attribute of humanity that they share? And so they were at, at once licenses to escape the world and invitations to change the world. So that's the legacy of these religions. So then we have this question whether uh, this circle of beliefs is sufficient to us now. And we might need then to have other transformations. Uh, uh, and a theme in those transformations is this theme that I just described, that we we become more more human by becoming more godlike. And what is our aim? Our aim is to live in such a way that we can die only once, uh, instead of dying by installments, little by little. And one of the things that we would ask from politics is that it increase the chances that we could live in that way. Uh, so then there's this question, do, we, do, we do, do these institutional changes that have been the object of discussion here in the course need to be accompanied by a series of religious changes that deepen and generalize this view? Now that then introduces another set of conflicts because some would say, but here I get off the boat. I accept these institutional changes so far. Mm -hmm. But the prophet comes with a sword, and he wants to go further. Mm -hmm. He wants a change in the character of human experience. Uh, and I think that the gates of prophecy are never closed. They're always open. And that this, this power of prophetic insight and of renewal in our, in our hopes and expectations is permanent. Uh, so, and therefore, I, I, if you ask me what I, what I believe in, I believe in political revolution, not systemic change, but these things that we've spoken about, political and economic, and religious revolution. And Tocqueville said, every great revolution is necessarily both political and religious because it has to do with both institutions and consciousness. Uh.
So I'm, as you notice, uh, as we go on, uh, I'm doubling the bet. <laughs> more and more. <laughs> and I, I'm not disguising it. <laughs> so the next theme is the theme of civil society. So, and I'll tell you what then leads me to think of this. So in the structure of this institutional argument, one major part, and part that's occupied most of the time, is the democratization of the market or transformation of the economy. And to me, a progressive approach to the supply side is the heart of the progressive position today in, in general. Huh? Without that, we don't have the rest. Uh, so that's one part. With its characteristic themes of vanguard and rearguard, finance and the real economy, labor and capital. The second part is democratic politics and the substitution of the weak, flawed democracy today by high energy democracy. The third uh, is education and the, the, the creation of this individual, especially through education, but more generally through the haven of safeguards and capabilities, who can be who can exercise agency in the midst of this world, open to contest and experiment. Now, there's a possible fourth theme, which has to do with the organization of civil society outside the state and outside the market. And this is the subject that I want to come to now. So the basic idea is that in addition to the question of how to reorganize the economy, how to reorganize the politics of the state, there's the question of the organization of civil society outside the state and outside the market. And the intuition that stands behind the proposal of this theme is that a disorganized society is unable to generate alternatives or to act on it. And furthermore, that the organization of, self -society, of civil society outside the state is not self-evident. It's not a subject that resolves itself automatically. Uh, it, it is a subject for institutional discussion. And now there are two sides to this discussion. So one side has to do with our ability and our willingness to cooperate and the organization of cooperative regimes. So, and there is this historical paradox that some countries have tried out many institutional regimes and failed at all of them. And other countries uh, have, and that seems to have to do with their difficulty in cooperation. And other countries have excelled in cooperation. I think the characteristic of the United States is the exceptional ability to cooperate in peace and in war across class and racial lines. Uh, and the question is where this ability to cooperate comes from and how it can be sustained and developed. So the premise is it's not a constant, it's a variable. And there are things that we can do to strengthen it. Now, what in general is the best regime of cooperation? One way to state the problem in general forms is that the best regime of, the co of, the co of cooperation 
is the one that is most hospitable to innovation. Every innovation, whether it's technological, conceptual, organizational, or institutional, disturbs the established cooperative regime because it raises the question, who wins or who loses under the innovation? And then there's a conflict because the innovation is seen as threatening to some and is benefiting others. So in principle, the best regime of cooperation would be the one that moderates this inevitable tension between cooperation and innovation. Now, you can generalize this idea in the following form. Um, the, the advanced societies, the contemporary societies, face two functional imperatives. Imperatives that have to do with their ability to develop, to prosper, to flourish. One imperative is the enhancement of agency. They require workers and citizens, people who are able to engage critically with the context, to assess it, to revise it. That's the substance of agency. Agency is manifest in the ability to innovate. But at the same time, they require the development of the higher forms of cooperation. Among the attributes of the higher forms of cooperation are that they should not be dogmatically fixed to a particular institutional form. But they, as we examined in the case of the idea of the market, that the market has no single natural and necessary form. And that they should not condemn people to a narrow form of experience or of work because of the accidents of their birth. Uh, that they should allow for the superior form of interaction between people and machines, in which the people don't just mimic the machines, the people just don't do the repetitious work of the machines, the people complement the machines and do what the machines can do. Uh, under the higher forms of cooperation, free work should be really free, which means that, as the liberals and socialists of the 19th century understood, economically dependent wage labor comes under suspicion as being an inferior and effective form of free labor compared to the higher forms self-employment and cooperation. But then we need to innovate in the regimes of property or of economic decentralization so that self-employment and cooperation can be compatible with the aggregation of resources of scale. So these two functional imperatives, the enhancement of agency, and the development of the willingness and of the ability to cooperate complement each other, but they're also in tension with each other. Because agency expressed in innovation disturbs the cooperative regime and threatens it. And so the highest cooperative regime is the one that diminishes this tension. That's the fundamental. Now, so one way to look at this problem that I'm raising of the organization of civil society, or the accumulation of social capital, as it's sometimes described, is that it has to do with this, with the ability to cooperate, and with the relation of the ability to cooperate to the enhancement of agency. The other way to consider the problem is from the standpoint of social cohesion problem of social cohesion. What is the basis of social union in these societies? Now, this is a famous problem in the history of sociology and of social theory. And the, the idea was formulated by sociologists like Tergis 
and Durkheim. And the idea was that the basis of union, of cohesion in society, used to be similarity or homogeneity, as in Durkheim's idea of mechanical solidarity. You have a society in which it's segmented into parts, but each part mirrors the other. So they're all alike. And the basis of, so of solidarity is their alikeness. The alikeness may be ethnic, racial, cultural, religious, and organizational or institutional. Now we have these societies in which there has to be differentiation, functional differentiation, and in which each one has a specialized role in the division of labor. That leads to what Durkheim called organic solidarity. So the basis of union has to be functional interdependence rather than affinity. Mm. And then there's an obvious problem. The problem is functional independence is not enough. Durkheim recognized that it was not enough. And he attempted to find an ideological solution, like the idea of the individual in an interdependent society which would then cast a halo over this functional independence and supplement it. But the, it was not a, it was, Durkheim himself recognized <coughs> this was not a good solution to the problem that he himself posed. Uh, now, this uh, problem of social cohesion, this unresolved problem in modern social theory and modern sociology, is in turn related to a problem which I have evoked in the course, which is the change in the character of nations. So nations used to be, I said, tribes. Tribes based on consanguinity, affinity, similarity, homogeneity, and manifest in shared customs. So as I said, to be a Roman, meant to live according to the customs of the ancient Romans. That was the idea of the nation. Uh, and now nations are embarked on a, on a voyage toward another destination, in which they are ceasing to be tribes, and they are becoming experiments in a particular way of being human. In other words, a form of moral specialization within humanity. So now the idea is there's no natural way of organizing society. So humanity develops by developing its power and potential in different directions. And to the extent that it converges, it converges because it becomes different. So there's a, a, a dialectical relation between divergence and union. Now, it's along that, in that voyage, I said, an accident takes place. The accident arises from the evisceration of the tangible content of these collective identities. The collective identities used to be tangible, that is expressed in particular customs. Each tribe had its different customs. Each nation had its different customs. And because it was tangible, it was also porous, because these were not abstractions. They were not ideas. And they were susceptible to reciprocal influence and recombination. Now these collective identities are hollowed out of some of their tangible content because the nations of the world forming their collective differences under the shield of armed states go through the whole world and try to examine what works, what do they need to do in order to be powerful and prosperous. I gave the example of the, the canonical example of the Meiji Restoration 
in Japan in the 19th century. So the Japanese say, we're threatened by invasion by being invaded by the Western powers. If we are to remain independent, we have to study the world and find out what we need, what we need to do, how we need to change in order to be able to stand up to them. And as a result, we have to go to the altar of this worldwide emulation and competition and tear out part of ourselves. That we have to give up some of our institutions, of our customs, of our habits, and, and imitate or import, copy arrangements from the others, and somehow merge them with what we keep, what we keep of our old, uh, of our old practices. And that's what I'm calling this evisceration of the collective identity. Now, then comes the modern idea of nationalism, which is really not an ancient idea, unlike this idea of the nation. It's an idea which is uh, that emerges in the in the 18th century and at the time of the French Revolution. It's a modern idea of the, um, the affirmation of national sovereignty under the shield of the armed state. And what happens then, this is the accident that I'm referring to, is that the desire for difference is aroused as actual difference begins to wane. So then we have the situation in which countries begin to hate one another, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike. So there's the impotent rage for difference aroused, inflamed by the weakening of the actual difference. And the desire for difference, unlike the actual difference, is not porous and not susceptible to compromise, but is the object of an intransigent faith. That's what we could see as the poisonous character of contemporary nationalism. This desire for difference aroused in the presence of the waning of the actual difference. So then there are three possible responses to this situation. One response is to say, is the response of regressive, archaic, autarkic nationalism. Restore the ancient ways, the traditional differences. Many of them just imaginary because they've been destroyed. Then there's a the response of liberal cosmopolitan. Suppress difference. So we'll all become the same in our fundamental ways of life and institution. And when there'll be little habits that will remain, there will be like a kind of folklore floating over this reality of convergence. The third position, it's the position that I want to defend, is equip the desire for difference so that we can create actual difference. So that we can arm the economies and the states of the world with the power to develop difference. So on this view, difference is not the problem. Difference is the solution. This is the opposite of the premise of much of classical politi liberal political theory. The problem is that we live in this free society in which we, you know, we're all different. But here the idea is that difference is what we want. Uh, and so, and it becomes less dangerous the more it's real. It's dangerous if it's this abstract rage or will to difference, and less dangerous if we can create actual difference, because actual difference is subject to compromise and reciprocal influence, and is porous and, and real. Now, against the background of these two ways of thinking about the problem of civil society, one having to do with the ability to cooperate in its relations to the nation, and the other with the problem of social cohesion and its relation to 
the change in the character of the nation, of the natural difference, comes in the basic idea animating this part of the proposal. The basic idea is that cohesion arises in these societies from collective action. And from the multiplication of forms of collective action, uniting people who come from different parts of society. So difference is not, cohesion is not like a patrimony, which we either have or don't have. It's something that we produce, that we create. And we create it through joint action, through acting together. And this problem, then, is dramatized by an experience of the social democracies, especially the European social democracies, because they used to be tribes, many of them, like a country like Sweden. It's like a peasant society that became rich. And they look alike, they have consanguinity, they speak the same language, they belong to the same church. And now they're becoming less alike. So the traditional basis of social union in those societies was against the background of a high level of homogeneity, money transfers organized by the state. But those money transfers organized by the state only seem to be an adequate basis of social union against the background of the homogeneity. As soon as the homogeneity begins to be disrupted or corroded by migratory flows or by other forms of, of cultural and social pluralism, heterogeneity, the inadequacy of money as a social cement becomes manifest. Uh, so it never really was an adequate social cement, it only just seemed to be against the background of the homogeneity. If the homogeneity goes down, its inadequacy becomes obvious. So where then can cohesion arise from? Cohesion can only arise from action on this view. Uh, and that is also related to this other solution to the problem of the nation. Equip the desire for difference. Create difference create difference so these forms of collective action that are multiplied in the state then um, are instruments for the creation of difference. So prophecy depends on memory. Prophecy works with memory. But prophecy is more important than memory. And on this view, the differences that we create are much more important than the differences that we remember and inherit. We inherit them so that we, we can create new ones. And we are unified by action, by collective action, and by the multiplication of forms of collective action. So that's the basic idea. And now, again, I think that the most important sources of, of, set, of a union with this character in the contemporary societies would not be ones restricted to civil society outside the market or outside politics. They would have to do with the transformation of the market and the politics. So the inclusive and deepened knowledge economy that I evoked with the higher level of trust that it presupposes already signals in the direction of this union. It presupposes action, collective action, engagement, replacing single command and control. And similarly, the high energy democracy ex extends the opportunities and the need for these forms of collective action. So that's much more important than anything that takes place narrowly in the sphere of civil society outside the market and outside the state. Nevertheless, in civil society, there are also initiatives that we can take that strengthen cohesion 
and this higher forms of cooperation, this accumulation of social capital. And what are they? So first, the character of education. One of the attributes of education I'll discuss next will be the reliance on cooperation among students, among teachers, among schools. Uh, cooperation characterizes the method for practices of advanced science. And it should also characterize education even in its earlier stages. A second example would be social service, uh, military service, conscription, on the, on the Republican principle that in a republic, the army is not part of the country paid for by the other parts and defended. The army is necessarily the nation in arms. Uh, and that's the Republican principle. If a large part of youth is exempted from military service, it should then be subject to mandatory social service. And in mandatory social service, they can also receive basic military training to be part of a reserve force that can be mobilized in case of national emergency. But their, most of their time in that service would be spent in, ideally, some part of the country different from the part that they come from. In according to their direction of educational interest, of professionalization, participating in the building of the country, depending on what their field is. And the general principle standing behind this idea of social service is that every able-bodied adult in the society should have two roles. You should have a role in the system of production and of skilling, and he should have a role in helping to take care of other people beyond the boundaries of his own family. And this is the only adequate basis of social solidarity. Uh, so, um, what is the empirical basis on which the conjecture about who we are on which this relies. Now, let me mention a fact which uh, relates to this argument. So studies have been done in the United States. Um, philanthropy, not just as the giving of money, but as the giving of time. And of course, the giving of time is, in principle, much more important than the giving of money. Uh, and much more exemplary of social cohesion and solidarity. Now, it turns out that uh, when you study the relation between the willingness of people to give time to philanthropic activity and a very simple fact, which is how many children do they have? There is a linear relationship between the, li the, the number of children they have and their willingness to give time. Uh, it's an astonishing paradox, because you have to think that the more children they have, the less time they have. But it's the opposite, that the more children they have, the more time they're willing to give. And why is that? It's because it seems that the heart grows, right? Uh, and so you have more children, they take more time, then you have more time to give. So th this, is, this, is, this is the surprising reality. And the person who has no children and is all alone has no time. Uh, so uh, this is the, this is the, the factual, so engagement, cohesion can only arise from this willingness to engage in other people's lives beyond the boundaries of the family. Now, the third example with respect to civil society, then has to do with another issue that also came up before, before which is the provision of public services. 
So the way in which societies provide public services is the way in which they build their own future. That civil society builds itself or has its future built for it by the state through the provision of public services. The dominant form of provision of public services in the whole world remains what I call administrative Fordism. That is, productive Fordism, industrial Fordism, is the large-scale production of standardized goods and services by these rigid machines and production processes. Conventional industry, the previous vanguard of production. And it's now replaced by the new vanguard of the knowledge economy, which emerges in the insular In the administrative realm, there's no counterpart to the knowledge economy. All we have is what you would call uh, this administrative Fordism, which is the provision of low quality, standardized public services by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state. And by low quality, I mean simply of lower quality than the equivalent services that might be bought on the market by someone with money. The only obvious alternative to administrative Fordism seems to be the privatization of public services in favor of profit-driven firms. But there is another alternative, and this other alternative would gain increasing importance in the course of the 21st century. So the idea is the state must be responsible for the universal provision of a floor, a minimum, of universal public service. And the state must also operate at the ceiling in the development of the most costly and complicated public services. But in the broad middle zone between the floor and the ceiling, the state would partner with independent civil society in the experimental and competitive provision of public services. And that would be the best way to enhance the quality of the services. So, so in other words, the state would be, as it were, colonized, if you like, and become the partner of this organized civil society. The state would help organize civil society, finance it, equip it, fund it, monitor it, in this provision in which cooperatives of specialists in health and education and so forth would partner with the state in the provision of the public services, but not for profit, not part of the money. And then civil society, as it were, is participating in the building of its own future through this partnership with the state. And that is then a powerful inducement to the self-organization of civil society outside the market and outside the state. So it has two goals or two justifications. One justification is the enhancement of the quality of the public services to escape the limits of this administrative Fordism. And the other justification is to provide an inducement and inspiration to the self-organization of civil society outside the market and state. Because we want the society to be organized. Only an organized society can, uh, can generate alternatives and act on them. So those are three examples of initiatives that would give substance to this idea of cohesion and the self-organization of civil society outside the state. But as I said, I believe that they're of less practical significance than the implications of the reorganization of politics and of production for the change. Because after all, the fundamental experience of life in civil society will be shaped by what economic life is like, by what our political life is like. That's where our ideas of the limits of the possible will come from. 
Now let me stop and ask for your engagement again uh, on this subject. So uh, this is the answer to Durkheim going to, so Durkheim said, fun, first he said functional inter interdependence is enough to solve the problem. Of then he said it's not enough. There also has to be an ideal. There has to be an ideological supplement to the functional system. And, the, and I think, and he thought, he recognized that the ideological supplement is not enough. The supplement has to come from some form of action. It's only by acting, and acting purposeful action in which we develop purpose-driven action, drawing people from different parts of society together is the real basis of social cohesion. And money is not enough to replace the absence of social solidarity. Yes? On the question of peacetime conscription, I'm wondering how you think introducing a program like that might be possible in those societies where there is no tradition of a peacetime conscription. It seems like those societies that do, or those states that do have that kind of uh, requirement either develop them millennia ago or <laughs> develop them in the in response to a great war or conflict or something. No, I'm, just, well, I'm surprised by this statement of yours because conscription is fairly universal. Yeah. It's, it's the, you know, so cons conscription was associated with democracy and with nationalism. Yeah. So the, uh, there was also conscription in hierarchical societies in which soldiers were recruited by force, right? So, like, the, and it's interesting to observe that the potential, so take, take the opposition of France, revolutionary France, to its enemies immediately after the revolution. So, and, and the ability to exploit the technological potential of the new artillery that was developed at the end of the 18th century. So in order properly to exploit the artillery, its technological advantage, you had to be able to combine infantry with artillery. The artillery had to be movable in the theater of operations, right? Uh, and the land force had to be able to disperse in the theater and unite in a flexible way. The, auto, the autocratic and aristocratic states of Europe were unable to do this because they did have conscript armies of reluctant peasants. And someone had to stand behind the infantry unit with bayonets to prevent them from running away. So this was a limit then on the utilization of advanced technology. And in general, it seems that there's a very close relation between social plasticity and the ability to exploit the potential of technology. And this is just a primitive example of a very, very general theme. So, but France had an army of citizens, a conscript army also, but a conscript army based on the new national ideal and on the ideal of, of Republican life. Huh? And, so, and it was able to do on this. Now, conscription it's in, in, all, in all states that participate in world history and are subject to war, to invasion, to struggle, they need to have an army. And and in the 19th and 20th century, conscription became very universal. So why was it abolished? It was abolished in countries like the United States. So there was a justification by the military of the need for specialized cadres. Uh -huh. But uh, the real justification is that in the expeditionary uh, wars that the, uh, that the Americans started to promote, uh, like the 
20, 20 or 21st century equivalents to the war against the Barbary pirates. They, uh, uh, they were inconvenienced by having the children of the elites in the army, right? Because this was the problem that became manifest during the Vietnam War. So uh, they wanted to have their hands untied. And the best way to have the hands untied in these class societies is to have an army of poor people who have no political influence or voice. So that's then what led to the, uh, to the abolition of conscription. And in the United States and in many of these other societies, the, the progressives said, said not a word when this Republican principle of conscription was overturned. And a principle was, and, and they accepted the principle of a mercenary army, which is entirely subversive of Republican principles. That seems to me to be the real explanation. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm... so you have so so where 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 do you, where does it come closest to this idea of of the nation in arms? To take one society which lives in perpetual peace, Switzerland, uh, there is universal conscription; everyone participates, everyone is armed, and so forth, uh, and they're always at peace. And the opposite is Israel. Israel is at war, and Israel is endangered, but the nation, the army is the nation at, at war. And they don't even have professional military academies because every officer has to have been a soldier. Yeah, so I'm not questioning the merits of the argument. I'm just, I guess I'm wondering if the political uh, willpower exists in the United States. I just worry that you introduce something like this, you might get a like bipartisan political resistance to it that you will just be insurmountable. Against it, you mean? Against, against it, right? I just well, I agree. It seems to me once conscription has been abolished, right, it's very hard to reintroduce it. And uh, you know, uh, in my country, in in, in Brazil, uh, we had this debate about conscription. So conscription is part of the law. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of people are exempted. You simply say you don't want to do it, and they say you're exempted uh, because they, they don't need them. And so in reality, de facto, the vast majority of recruits are poor, are for, are poor from the poor classes. Now, we then, I say we because I, I participated in this debate. So the law now says that all young Brazilians uh, who are exempted from mandatory social service will be subject to mandatory social service. No one knows that this is part of the law in Brazil, but it is the law. Uh, it is the law now. And I commented, I remember commenting with, with the with, with the officers, with the high command. A government that could send the bourgeois youth of Sao Paulo to the Amazon to spend a year there working would do anything. If they can do that, they can do anything. But, but it is the law. So I think that in, in, in any of these societies, that would represent a fundamental uh, And I'm not diminishing the obstacles to it. But if you think about it, it, it it's something fundamental. Every, and then you, 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 you go to another part of the country from the part you're from. You participate in the building of the country. People of all classes mingle. Uh, and uh, this is the basis of social, this is the real basis of social cohesion. Now, you may not want it because you may not accept the sacrifice. Or you may, allow, you may want the sacrifice to be in some diminished form. So you can take it in little doses. But it'd still be an improvement. That, that would be the argument. But I'm not disagreeing with you about how, how hard it is. But what's the alternative to it? So on, on the question of peacetime uh, service, national service.
a principle of national service is not mandatory, voluntary, and financed by the state. Uh, the, the question of military conscription is the question of the ability of the state to survive in a world of armed states in which they threaten one another. And on whom should that, on whom should that danger fall? Uh, so it's, uh, it's a that's a fundamental question of national union. So in my country, we never had a real war, a major war, since the war against Paraguay in the 19th century. The Brazilian elites have never had to send their children to die in wars. Now, that's very different from the experience of the Americans. Until recently, I mean, the Second World War, the Korean War, every, every elite fam almost every elite family in the, in the United States sent its sons to die in wars. And that, that, that's a, a fundamental moral change in, in the experience of the relation to the nation. There's a fundamental difference of, of where, where the experience of being a member of the elite is you're on top, you profit, but when push comes to shove and the hour of danger calls, you're nowhere to be seen. That's a, that's a, a completely different relation to the, to the idea of the republic and, and, of, and of the nation. And I, I can't understand how the Americans tolerated that. How they, how, how they accepted that, that change in their national compact. We're out of time. So I had intended the discussion of education for today, but it will be.